Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. It's a central banker world, and that world is increasingly volatile, deformed, and full of risks. Today, we're speaking with a guest I am especially keen to interview, Mr. David Stockman, economic policymaker, politician, and financier. Mr. Stockman represented Southern Michigan in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1976 to 1981, and later served as the director of the Office of Management and Budget in the Reagan administration, and was the youngest cabinet member of the 20th century. Since then, he has held executive positions in many of the most influential banking, buyout, and private equity firms, including the Blackstone Group and Solomon Brothers. He is author of The Great Deformation, The Corruption of Capitalism in America, which is a blunt and sometimes delightfully and deservedly scathing examination of the various fiscal and policy blunders that have degraded our current and future hopes for prosperity. Be sure to have your blood pressure medication handy as you read it, because not only does it detail a litany of regulatory and policy blunders of the recent past, it reads like it was lifted from today's headlines. He also runs the popular and excellent website, David Stockman's Contra Corner, where he both blogs and assembles other excellent economic content for you to read, so be sure to visit it regularly. Welcome, David. It's an honor to have you as our guest. Very happy to be with you again, Chris. So uh, there's su such a target-rich environment to talk about with you. Where do we start? You know what I'd love to start with is I was actually a little bit shocked uh, to see Elizabeth Warren come out and say that she didn't support auditing the Federal Reserve. And uh, I was a little shocked because she's been a populist and, and presented herself that way. And I can't think of anything more populist-oriented than to have exquisite transparency into the organization that is entrusted with printing money out of thin air and handing it out? Well, you know, I think that's a, a really good starting point. I actually had, uh, I posted a blog on that two days ago. The title uh, happens, uh, happened to be uh, Audit the Fed, comma, Shackle the Fed. And that's the difference between where uh, I would be, for instance, and where uh, Elizabeth Warren came out. Um, the liberals uh, don't have any objection at the end of the day to money printing. They are still under uh, the uh, Keynesian delusion that somehow zero interest rates will, uh, you know, rejuvenate, uh, rejuvenate the economy, that we don't have enough uh, borrowing in the system and that business and consumers, therefore, need to be encouraged to borrow more. You know, that whole uh, syndrome, that whole uh, framework, uh, obviously is wrong. It's failed dramatically. We can see that almost day by day as we enter another uh, calendar year and find that the economy, again, has not uh, taken off into escape velocity as we have been promised over and over as a result of all this monetary expansion. So uh, I think, uh, you know, we're getting uh, to the Rubicon here uh, in terms of where people stand on this issue. And uh, I do appreciate the fact that she has been pretty tough on Wall Street and the bailouts, and that is all to the good. But you have to ask, why did all this happen? Uh, why have we created so much uh, leverage and risk-taking uh, and kind of uh, unproductive uh, trading and churning in our financial markets? Did this, uh, you know, come out of the inherent uh, nature of capitalism? I don't think so. Has there been a, uh, you know, upgrade in the level of greed on Wall Street? I don't think so. It's always been there. The change is at the central bank. The change, the difference, is in monetary policy, which is out of control. We're now in the 73rd month of zero interest rates. That's the most important price in all of capitalism. 
and it's been pinned at zero uh, for 73 months, and they still can't quite get up the nerve to let it rise even by 25 basis points. So I think those uh, those points begin um, to uh, frame the issue, and uh, it's pretty clear that the kind of uh, anti-bailout liberals uh, like Elizabeth Warren uh, don't have a clue as to what the fundamental problem is, and, and that is obviously an overwhelmingly out of control central banks, not just uh, in the Eccles building here, but virtually every central bank in the world. Excellent points, David. You know, I, what it comes down to for me is this idea that, you know, if Elizabeth Warren was against the bailouts, I can't think of anything that's a more profound and pronounced and ongoing bailout than to drive interest rates to zero, prevent people who are savers from accumulating any interest returns on that money, and since they're not getting it, somebody is, and that turns out to be the banks and their balance sheets. So the Fed all on its own decided that it was going to, at the expense of one set of participants in the economy, punish them and reward another set, which I don't believe deserve to be rewarded. I can't think of anything that's more bailout-ish than that. No, that is the continuing uh, fundamental bailout that uh, has been in place uh, continuously since September 2008. Um, I actually addressed that yesterday in a blog when I went after Bank of America for you know its latest malfaction, uh, shifting the insured deposit money uh, from the North American Bank to London so it could be spread around among uh, you know some fast money hedge fund traders to pull off uh, various kinds of tax arbitrages. Well, the, the point I was making is that the banking system is not by any means fixed, that when you have a rogue operation like Bank of America now uh, facing something like $100 billion worth of settlements, fines, penalties, uh, recoveries, etc., that I think is a uh, sign that nothing has been fixed and all the dangers are still there. But my underlying point in taking after uh, Bank America was that they have $1.1 trillion worth of deposits on a $2 trillion balance sheet. My view is that the financial repression on the front end of the yield curve by the Fed is at least worth 300 basis points. I mean, we shouldn't have zero cost of money. We still do have inflation and taxes. That's worth about 30 billion, uh, arguably, uh, in 214 to Bank America in terms of reduced cost of funding their balance sheet. They had profits 11 and a half billion. So uh, make your comparison. And uh, the point I was getting at is that in a free market, they would be paying a lot more than zero for their deposits. Maybe the yield on some assets and loans would be a little higher, but I don't think it's symmetrical or parallel because if we actually allowed the free market to price debt and other financial securities, if we allowed the yield curve to find its own proper shape, based on honest price discovery in the market, uh, I think the demand for borrowing would fall and therefore interest rates would be uh, thereby impacted, whereas uh, the availability uh, of savings uh, would rise as uh, interest rates uh, normalized uh, to something that was reasonable. You put the two together and uh, you, find, you come to the conclusion, at least in my view, that bank earnings are massively overstated or distorted or malformed, if we can use that word, as a result of this massive financial repression by the Fed, that a uh, bank like Bank America which allegedly has rebuilt its balance sheet and regenerated uh, some equity, is basically the recipient uh, of this huge gift from the Fed. And so the banking system hasn't been fixed. Uh, it's 
simply the financial system that has been totally uh, distorted and malformed by this destructive monetary policy. So all of that lies in front of us. And uh, obviously, uh, as uh, we uh, move on here from month to month and quarter to quarter, um, you know, uh, the coiled spring, which is being uh, created uh, in the financial markets as a result of this uh, enormous intervention in money printing, uh, is likely uh, to unravel and uh, break out in ways that uh, are very hard to predict, but certainly uh, will be surprising and disruptive. Now, what you're referring to here is is uh, uh, the idea that I guess we just have all this speculative hot money. It, it's out there. When the Fed goes out and buys a trillion dollars of mortgage-backed securities and stuffs that cash back into the system, it has to go somewhere. And some of it leaks back into uh, the so-called excess reserves uh, just kicking around at the Fed. But some of that's hot money. It's out in the wild. It's got to do something. So it chases yield drives yields down even on junk debt to where it has a 5% handle. And, and in equities, we see some strange things. I, I'm sure, you know, perhaps you caught this on Zero Hedge, that, that there are uh, four cheese trucks running around this country that have a collective equity valuation of $100 million, $100 million. <laughs> which is a lot yeah. of cheese sandwiches, isn't it? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and I think that's the point. Uh, the mechanical Keynesians say don't not to worry the money is circulating uh, through the primary dealers as the Fed uh, until recent, you know, quit the QE, but until the end of QE, uh, bought $3.5 trillion worth of treasuries and GSEs uh, from, you know, the point of the crisis in September 2008 to uh, October. But don't not to worry about that because a lot of it just has come back as excess reserves um, <clears throat> at the New York Fed. I think what is totally missing in that analysis is that as that massive liquidity injection circulates through the canyons of Wall Street, it dramatically impacts the pricing of everything in the financial market. That is what caused, uh, you know, the money market to stay at zero. That's what causes the sharp repression of 30-year mortgage uh, yields or 10-year treasury yields or the entire uh, treasury curve along with it. Now, when you get false pricing, when you get um, uh, artificially uh, low prices, especially uh, on the front end of the curve in the money markets, that is simply a back doorway of creating more credit. In other words, uh, the money market or the repo market becomes the funding source for speculators buying up the curve, mismatching their maturities, collecting the spread, and laughing all the way to the bank because the Fed has promised them that it will keep their carry cost at zero uh, until further noticed with, with a lot of uh, prior indication, and that uh, the uh, assets that they're buying uh, will not allow be allowed to uh, drop dramatically in price, and so therefore uh, the arbitrage is uh, a no-brainer. Now, that's what happens when $3.5 trillion circulate from the printing press, uh, the send button at the Fed, through Wall Street in the primary dealer system, and some of it comes back into uh, you know, the excess reserve accounts. In the process, all pricing is distorted. Uh, all uh, assets, financial assets, get rehypothecated and you know, carried uh, in the uh, overnight uh, credit markets, the repo markets, the short-term unsecured uh, uh, debt markets. And that is the mechanism by which uh, this huge financial bubble uh, conti is continuously inflated, uh, whether it's on the fixed income side, the equity side, or all the uh, derivatives uh, and uh, you know, uh, trades that can be fashioned uh, in those uh, markets.
So let's look at just one aspect of, of all that money sloshing around, and it's one that really has uh, got my attention full on. It's what's happened and is happening in the shale patch. So you, know, you have a bunch of drillers out there, and uh, they're uh, punching holes all over North Dakota, Colorado, Arkansas, you name it. And uh, the way it was working was that they would drill these wells at a pretty horrendous cost, 7 to 10 million bucks a pop. And then they would uh, take the uh, revenue streams that would come off of that, collateralize it in some way, and go put that in the market, uh, sell junk debt, however they wanted to do that, and then get more capital and keep going. And uh, uh, David, as I analyzed this, I saw that these companies were not generating any positive free cash flow when oil was at 100 a barrel. What, what, what are you seeing in that space, and what do you think happens from here uh, with oil at 50 a barrel? Well, I think you've uh, put your, uh, you, you know, finger right on the issue. Uh, we keep talking about the fact that all of this central bank intervention and pegging of market prices in virtually every class of financial asset is generating huge underlying malinvestments in the real economy, and there is probably no more dramatic case than the oil patch. Um, it is evident right now that oil is not uh, capable of sustaining at 100 or $110 a barrel. As the world economy cools down from this enormous central bank boom that we've had for the last almost two decades, and therefore there isn't enough demand to support the price at, a, at 100 or plus dollars a barrel. On the other hand, uh, the desperate uh, scramble for yield that was generated by financial repression uh, by the Fed and other central banks drove tens of billions, hundreds of billions worth of capital into very high-risk investments such as junk bond funding of uh, you know the uh, investments in the shale patch. Now, if you look at it objectively, there is probably no price in the last eight or nine years that's been more volatile than the oil price. <laughs> you know, it went from 80 to 150, back to 30, uh, up to 115, and uh, now back to in the 40s at some point in a relatively uh, you know short period of time here. That in that kind of commodity market. Uh, pouring uh, fixed uh, yield uh, debt uh, down the well bore for high cost um, um, uh, shale just uh, was the height of irrationality. And yet uh, that is what uh, occurred. And now we're on the back side of that. And that is that all of the uh, malinvestment is going to come undone, and uh, there is going to be, there has already been a massive adjustment even within a few months after the price uh, adjustment uh, took hold. Uh, oil uh, rigs, uh, you know, the number already is down from a peak of 1,600 uh, in October uh, to under 1,200 now, and is heading down 80 or 90 a week. And that ricochets through the whole system in terms of, uh, you know, local uh, economic activity and jobs and uh, multiplier effects and so forth. There was a story uh, two days ago about the building boom in Houston. Uh, 18% of all the commercial square footage uh, under construction in the United States today is in Houston, 80 different high-rise office buildings. And uh, there is going to be <laughs> a huge collapse of demand as a result of this uh, uh, dramatic uh, adjustment that's occurring. Well, the point is, all of that adds up to economic waste. Uh, you bring people to North Dakota, and pretty soon, uh, uh, after a few years of earning 200000 a year, they're back in their pickups, uh, heading uh, back to where they came from. You create a massive local boom in the Eagle Ford, and all of a sudden everything is drying up from restaurants to bars to car washes and all the rest, uh, you create a massive uh, bubble in Houston as a result of uh, 
the oil price and the shale boom, and all of a sudden uh, there are going to be uh, half-completed office buildings everywhere. You, you, that that, that uh, the Keynesians don't even recognize that or accept that because they have no history or balance sheets. That's all yesterday. <laughs> Their view is, what do we do tomorrow without recognizing that there has been an enormous uh, liquid uh, dissipation of resources, a misallocation of resources, uh, and very brutal uh, financial losses, particularly in the uh, junk bond market, uh, that resulted from the efforts of central banks to control the modern economy. It's it's just plain, flat, uh, wrong. The policy is destructive, and we somehow need to get back to the point where we let the market price uh, the financial system and where we let the economy drive uh, the financial markets in terms of capital that's needed and profits that are produced and valuations uh, that are honestly discovered uh, in markets that are not um, manipulated and pegged by the central banks. You brought up so many great points in there, and, and one thing that stuck out for me was this idea that we're under a couple of decades of, of Fed intervention. You know, once upon a time, the Fed was not that interventionist, and under Greenspan, that really started to shift. So. The way I look at this, David, is, you know, we had a little corporate bond hiccup in 94. It led to this really bizarre thing um, known as the sweeps program, where banks were allowed to effectively sweep uh, demand monies out of various accounts simply for the optics of being able to say, hey, we don't have to hold anything in reserve. Now we can really jack the lending up. That gave us a stock boom, which then, you know, crashed and required the Fed to come in and ride, you know, interest rates down to 1%, which gave us a housing boom, which was even more destructive than the stock boom before. And in response to that, they've taken us to 0%. Uh, and, and so my perception is that uh, the Fed is is compounding little errors and making them larger over time. And I feel like we're at a place now where they've got themselves really boxed in a corner where there's only two ways out of this. One is, Glorious growth forever, hey Hosanna, nothing goes wrong. And the other is a pretty bad accident. How do you see it? Well, I uh, take the second view, and I think it's not only the Fed in uh, the U.S. economy, but it's global. I think the central bank driven global boom of the last two decades is over. Perhaps it started in 1994 when uh, the Greenspan uh, Fed uh, lost its nerve uh, in the face of that little bond market hiccup. And over on the other side of the Pacific, uh, Mr. Deng said, uh, you know, to be rich is glorious. And the great uh, China uh, construction and debt boom uh, got underway. Um, we are now uh, through that. We're done with that. Uh, we're in the crack-up phase. And uh, I think, you know, there are four big characteristics of that which are going to basically shape the way uh, the economy and the markets unfold as we go forward. I think you're going to see increasing desperation and extreme central bank financial repression because they have gotten themselves painted so deep into the corner that they are lost, they are desperate, and so one, you know, almost week by week, we have another central bank. This week it was Sweden lowering their money market rates into negative territory. Uh, you know, obviously the Swiss bank is already there. Denmark's bank is there. The EC is there on the deposit rate. The Bank of Japan is there. Um, all of the central banks of the world now are desperately... Um, you know, driving interest rates into negative territory. And uh, I believe that they're lost. Uh, they are in a race to the bottom, whether they acknowledge it or not. Uh, you know, the uh, Central Bank of China can't sit still much longer when uh, the RMB is appreciated something like uh, 30% against the uh, Japanese yen because of uh, the massive, um, you know, uh, bubble or monetary expansion that's being created there. 
So that's the first thing going on. Central banks out of control, in a race to the bottom, sliding by the seat of their pants, making up, uh, you know, really incoherent theories as they go. Everybody's talking about deflation and 2% inflation targets as being some magic elixir. There isn't a shred of proof anywhere that economies grow better over time at 2% than 0.8%. I mean, it is just uh, made up. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is increasing market disorder and volatility. Uh, in the last three months, uh, the stock market has uh, behaved <laughs> like a drunken sailor, but it's really just uh, a bunch of robots and day traders uh, ch uh, trading ch chart points until uh, somebody can figure out uh, what is happening directionally in the world. Uh, they just keep trading it back to 290. It bounces off. Uh, it takes a dive. They trade it back. It has nothing to do with information or, you know, incoming uh, um, data about the real world. Uh, we have today the 10-year uh, German uh, bond trading at uh, 29 and a half basis points. Well, the German economy has been reasonably strong, fueling the Chinese boom. That export boom is over. The Chinese economy is faltering. Uh, Germany is going to have its own problems, but clearly 29 basis points uh, on a 10-year is irrational, even in the case of Germany, to say nothing of uh, you know the 160 available today on the 10-year for Spain and Italy. Um, both of those countries are in deep, deep fiscal uh, uh, decline. Uh, there is no obvious way for them to dig out of the debt trap they're in. Uh, it's going to get worse over time. There's huge risk in those bonds, especially because uh, there's no guarantee that the EU will remain intact or the euro will survive. Why in the world would uh, anybody in their right mind be owning the Italian debt at 160 other than the fact that they're front-running the massive purchases that uh, Draghi has promised and now the Germans have acquiesced to over the next year or two. But that only kicks the can down the road. One of these days, uh, the central banks are going to falter, um, and the market is going to reset violently to prices that reflect uh, the true uh, risk on all this sovereign debt and uh, the uh, pretty cloudy outlook uh, that's ahead for the world market. We now have something like Four trillion worth of sovereign debt spread over Japanese issues, uh, the major European countries uh, that are trading at negative yields. Obviously, that is uh, one irrational and second completely unsustainable, and yet it's another characteristic of what I call these um, disorderly markets. Uh, malinvestment is now coming home to roost. It will be driving a huge deflation of commodity and industrial prices worldwide. You can see that in iron ore now barely holding $60 from a peak of 200 Obviously, it's the whole uh, oil patch that we've talked about. Uh, look at the um, uh, uh, Baltic uh, dry index. Uh, that is a measure, one, of faltering demand for shipments, and two, massive overbuilding of uh, bulk carrier capacity as a result of this uh, boom, uh, central bank driven boom that we've had in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. So that is going to be ripping through uh, the financial system, uh, the global economy in ways that we've never before experienced and so therefore um, in ways that are hard to predict what all <laughs> you know, the ramifications and cascading effects will be. But clearly, it's something that we haven't uh, seen in modern times uh, or uh, ever before. The degree of overinvestment, excess capacity in everything from uh, iron ore mines uh, to uh, dry bulk carriers, aluminum plants, steel mills, uh, and on down the line. And then finally, Clearly, 
demand has run smack up against peak debt, um, and I think that's the right word for it. We had a tremendous, uh, uh, you know, study come out in the last week or so from McKinsey, who do a pretty good job of trying to calculate and track and tote up the amount of credit outstanding, public and private, in the world. We are now at the 200 trillion threshold. That's up uh, from uh, only about 140 trillion uh, at the time of the crisis. So we've had a 60 trillion expansion worldwide of debt just since uh, 2008. During that same period, though, the GDP of the world's up a little more than 15 trillion, uh, from 55 or mid 50s roughly to 70 trillion. So uh, we've we've uh, generated because of central bank uh, money printing and all of this uh, unprecedented monetary stimulus, uh, we've generated something like 60 trillion of new debt in the world and have barely gotten 15, 17 billion of new GDP for for all of that uh, effort. Uh, And I think that is a measure of why uh, you know the the fundamental uh, era uh, is changing that the boom is over and the crack up is underway when uh, you see that kind of uh, uh, minimal yield from the massive amount of new debt that has been generated now I'd only wrap this up by calling to uh, attention to the fact that within that global total of 200 billion, the numbers for China are even more startling. At the time of the crisis, uh, we'll go back to 2000. Uh, China had two uh, trillion worth of uh, credit outstanding. It's now 28 trillion. <laughs> so uh, we've had just massive 14x growth in 14 years. There, there's nothing like that in recorded history, nor is there any plausible reason to believe that an economy which is basically under a command and control system that is run from the top down uh, through uh, the party cadres could possibly create 26 trillion in new debt in that period of time without uh, massive uh, you know inefficiencies and waste and the stakes uh, everywhere within the system, especially since they have no markets, they have no feedback mechanisms, it all comes cascading down from the top and everybody lies to the next (laughs) uh, party above them. And I think the system is uh, irrationally uh, out of control. In any event, my point was that At the time of the 2008 crisis, China had allegedly, if you believe their numbers, which uh, no one really should, but as reported, they had $5 trillion worth of GDP. It's now 10, so they've gained 5 of uh, GDP. Their debt uh, at uh, the time of the crisis uh, was $7 trillion. Now it's 28. So the debt is up more than 20 trillion, and uh, the GDP is up five. Uh, these are extreme, uh, unsustainable uh, deformations, if I can use that word, that just scream out danger ahead. Um, you know, mayhem has happened. <laughs> And uh, the unwinding of this and the resolution of this is not going to be pretty. Now, that's a a fantastic list. You've given us a number of characteristics of this uh, crack-up phase. We've got this increasing desperation by the central bankers. Obviously, they painted themselves in a pretty big corner. Uh, Can't can't possibly normalize interest rates now without creating just absolute world-class mayhem. Increasing market disorder and volatility because we've got all this malinvestment and we've got a lot of speculators and hot money and everything's mispriced, so who knows what, what anything is. And then this idea of, of peak debt, a uh, couple hundred trillion of debt outstanding, those are our hallmarks. When this deformation comes up against reality and, and goes through its its unwinding phase, paint that for me. What, what, is that, what does that look like? Is that Do markets just go haywire? Do, do we have 
flash crashes? Yeah. Is, uh... Uh, I, you know, it's a great question. And first of all, everybody ought to be uh, reasonably humble about their uh, predictions or forecasts because we have never been remotely in a world characterized by the things we've discussed uh, so far. 200 trillion worth of debt, nearly a 3x debt to income ratio worldwide. Um, the creation of new debt at a rate four or even more, four times or even more the amount of new GDP that's being uh, generated. Uh, central bank financial repression at the zero bound that wasn't even imaginable. And I just don't think you can um, stress that enough. Wind back 10 years. Who would have predicted? that any known uh, events in the world would have been sufficient to drive the central banks uh, to peg the money market, uh, the short-term rate, uh, at zero for 73 months running and actually 80 months once they get to July if they manage uh, to raise it then. So these fundamental characteristics and distortions are so novel and unique that it's really difficult for anyone uh, to predict how it will unwind, but uh, I think it's more like a coiled spring. Uh, and when finally uh, the pressure is released, you know, there's going to be uh, a lot of uh, flying parts and pieces uh, everywhere, and it'll amount to the great reset uh, in financial markets. Everything is dramatically overvalued. Uh, bonds, stocks, uh, until recently commodities, they're already going into their reset. And uh, I think it's just the first of uh, many waves uh, of repricing. Uh, and that means that you have multi-trillion bond bubbles in the world. You have multi-trillion stock market uh, bubbles in the world. And uh, they're going to resolve themselves uh, pretty violently. Uh, once confidence is lost. Ultimately, this is a, a con game going on in the world that uh, the central banks have gotten away for, uh, with for a long period of time, but it doesn't mean you can do it permanently. Sooner or later, the uh, weight of disbelief becomes uh, uh, too substantial, too great for even uh, the central banks uh, uh, to manage their way through. And we get a break, as they used to call it in old-fashioned times, a financial break. And once the financial break starts, we've seen a living demonstration of it in oil, 110 uh, in June, uh, you know, hitting around the uh, mid-40s and maybe another big leg uh, to drop very easily uh, in the months ahead. There wasn't one, you know, out of a hundred uh, so-called oil analysts that saw anything remotely like this coming, and yet the facts on the ground were all materializing, all emerging, all uh, you know, uh, discoverable uh, in June, uh, and yet no one saw it coming. So uh, maybe we take uh, kind of the oil model and suggest it's going to be replicated many times over in uh, other financial markets of the world as the um, central bank um, prop in this whole uh, bubble, you know, finally loses its um, traction. David, so many excellent points in there. I really want to focus on this idea of confidence. The central banks have really been uh, given a, a big vote of confidence. They've been given a lot of leeway. They're acting in cahoots with each other. Uh, they've been doing a lot. I'm reminded now of a, of a George Orwell quote, which is, in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. How revolutionary was uh, the finance minister of Greece's uh, pronunciations to the world? Just, just uh, <laughs> I watched the EU bureaucrats just absolutely go into a panic tizzy over what the things he was saying. How revolutionary I is that? Well, I, uh, you know, I think it was a pretty dramatic inflection point. Uh, I think uh, uh, of all the points he's made, and some of them obviously are for home consumption politically, but the point, fundamental point is that we have uh, the Greek nation, $350 billion worth of debt. We didn't 
asked to sustain that. It was forced on us by the EU bureaucracy and mechanism that essentially bailed out the banks of Germany and France and Italy and elsewhere and converted what was de facto defaulted debt issued by the Greek governments uh, prior to 210 into permanent uh, uh, obligations guaranteed by the taxpayers of Europe. And uh, that was a fundamental mistake. It was symptomatic of this whole kick-the-can um, uh, model uh, uh, that you know has ruled the world for many years now. And I think uh, what's happening at the moment, which uh, is getting t- t- more tense by the hour, is the Greeks have finally said, uh, no, um, we're not going to run our uh, economy and our uh, policy uh, as uh, based on the mandate that we have gotten from the people in order to uh, shield the taxpayers of Germany and Italy and France from the imprudent uh, obligations that they took on, unbeknownst really, uh, to the public on the street in Europe, um, but the obligations they took on because Brussels and Frankfurt were unwilling to allow uh, defaults to occur, losses in the banking system to happen, and um, the uh, uh, market process in finance to work its will. And uh, now we're at the point where um, the political contagion is breaking out because if they dare let Greece off the hook, how soon will there be a uh, upheaval in Spain and a new government? How soon will, will there be an upheaval in Italy and a new government? Um, I think uh, you're really at uh, an explosive inflection point here. They may come up with some words to tide this over for another few months while they negotiate, but uh, you're at a point where uh, Greece uh, owes $350 billion. It's got a GDP uh, of $280 billion at best. Um, most of what they owe is to the machinery of the IMF, the EU, the ECB. Uh, it's all been moved into the sphere of politics, and I think um, politics uh, is a much more ex- explosive and unpredictable process uh, than the markets recognize at the moment. In fact, I think the markets have their head in the sand. They are sheep. Uh, being led to the slaughter. Of course, the fast money thinks they'll get the word before anybody else, but um, the kind of rally that occurred in the last couple of days in the euro uh, and the yields on the uh, European, uh, EU members that are next in line um, are really supremely irrational. Uh, People, uh, you know, rational investors would be selling uh, the, their way out of the Italian bond as quick as they could get out of it, uh, or the Fra- French uh, bond, for, uh, for that matter. Uh, 60 basis points uh, for the 10-year debt of uh, France, uh, that is, uh, you know, a, a stunningly stupid condition. Uh, yet I think it's uh, symptomatic of... Uh, the way the markets are sleepwalking in the face of what looks to be like the beginning of a total breakdown of uh, politics within the EU. Now, what I loved about uh, what the Greek finance minister said, which I thought was a little too truthy for the markets, was he just said flat out, my country's broke. Right. And that's true. And and I think that it's a short hop, skip, and a jump from there to say, well, if Greece is broken, they're going to admit it, and that's going to have repercussions, then what do we say about Italy? or Spain, or Portugal, or Ireland, or Japan, or the United States, if you run the clock out long enough. What's interesting to me here is, you know, you're talking about Greece, and and, and I had always, you know, thought of it in my head. It's, a, it's an economy, it's a country, it's a nation state, but I'm looking at a chart here that shows uh, various things that have larger economies, GDPs, than Greece, and uh, right next on the list with a larger economy than Greece is uh, Boston. So, yeah, right, right. <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah. when we say they have 380 billion of debt. Uh, imagine that trying to, you know, Boston trying to figure out how to pay 380 billion of debt. But honestly, Boston has a more vibrant economy than Greece currently. Yeah, and you know, uh, I think uh, the the problem is Greece is the inflection point. It's not just the 350 billion that they can't uh, service. The the fact is they were bankrupt in 210. He was right. They should have proceeded uh, to write offs and uh, uh, you know uh, ejection if it needed to be from the euro uh, and the EU at the time. So, but they haven't, and that policy has become the universal policy of central banks in cahoots with governments all around the world. I mean, <laughs> look at Japan. Uh, their population is getting older by the day. Uh, their economy, notwithstanding all of this massive stimulus from Abenomics, is not expanding. Their total debt is something like 500% of GDP, uh, public and private. Their public debt is, uh, you know, two and a half times GDP off the charts. Um, this is a this is an equation that uh, can't uh, be sustained. It is uh, an explosive equation. So Greece may be uh, the size of Boston, but it. Um, symbolizes uh, a planet-wide policy and condition and deception about uh, the true uh, you know state of economic uh, and financial reality it's I thought that you know the chief lesson coming out of this and seeing the panic that's ensued is is that you're not supposed to say the obvious and, and that's really the biggest deformation is that uh, speaking the truth seems to have really slipped in the past uh, number of years and decades. And, and we're at the point now where we do have to deal with some real solid structural issues. If something can't be paid back, it won't. And, and so right now I look at what's happening in the, in the EU vis-a-vis -vis Greece, but soon to be coming to a theater closer to you, uh, is really they're just trying to solve this one question. And the question is, who is going to eat the losses uh, mm -hmm. There's just losses to be had. We're just, I guess, we're now to the point of arguing over who's going to take them. Uh, the standard IMF position, which they are uh, poor Ukraine. I mean, they had a great deal with Russia in December 2013. Yes. They yeah. reneged on that $20 billion with no strings attached relative to the IMF, which gave them 17 and a half very string-laden attachments. And they'll never dig out from under them is the lesson from that. And so the the as I look at it, it's really... The banker, political class on one side saying, we don't want to eat the losses. We think the people should. Greece is the first bar, uh, nation state I know of um, after Iceland to stand up and say, that's not how this is going to work out. Yeah, yeah it'll be very interesting to watch over the next uh, couple of weeks uh, how this plays out. I still think there is some possibility that they'll find a way to kick a rusty can down the road for a few months. Uh, you know, the Germans are saying they must complete the program. Well, what does complete mean and what does program mean? Uh, the new Greek government says it has a mandate um, not to extend uh, the program. Well, what does uh, extend really mean, and can people find ways to split hairs and uh, uh, you know twist words uh, so that uh, the differences, the vast black and white difference uh, between the north and south of Europe can be accommodated? Uh, I think maybe words can extend uh, the situation for a few months, but it's pretty clear now that... Um, the Europe is running into uh, a, a very uh, difficult place, um, and that uh, this isn't going to last much longer. Um, the uh, EU uh, and the German uh, differences over monetary policy, uh, the unrest that's in the electorates of, of all the major European countries uh, that are heading for elections, all of this creates... Um, pressures and tensions and, you know, fractures that I do not think are containable and manageable much longer, even if suddenly uh, next week you get an announcement that uh, they're going to get by for another 30 days. Uh, I don't think you can run the world 30 days at a time with this much built-up uh, uh, pressure and uh, uh, tension. 
And so, therefore, you know, at the end of the day, we are more uh, exposed uh, to unexpected uh, dislocations to the so-called black swan events uh, than ever before. And uh, when you have a system that has never been this unstable and fragile, um, in which uh, the environment is rich with opportunities for surprise and dislocation, um, I think it is a very dangerous time. I couldn't agree more, and, and since we can't predict what's going to happen, I'm constantly advising people that they should be prepared for almost anything. So true diversification is, is uh, really important these days. As, as a final comment from you, I'm wondering, um, you know, I'm, I'm watching this Greece thing as a Petri dish to figure out how this all might play out. This, this leftist party gets put in place and they've been given a mandate, they feel, and so they're going to go forward. The EU is in a tough position here because I don't think they can, quote unquote, let Greece get away with this. So they're going to have to be tough. But if they're too tough and they kind of crush these guys, you know who's waiting in the wings is uh, the party Golden Dawn, which is ultra uh, right wing fascist group coming out of that's in Greece. And there's a sort of rise of, of those sentiments I'm detecting all across Europe. And, and I think that's just what happens when you, you know, we saw this uh, in, in World War One, and, and then especially before World War Two, that strict austerity and things like the Versailles Treaty and all of that uh, just have a way of, of creating pressures that create either space for or new recruitment for uh, fairly extreme groups to arise. Uh, how do you do you see that as a danger or is yes, that something I think to... that I you know I agree with that completely and I think it's really the biggest danger at the end of the day it's not exactly about numbers and leverage ratios and bailout uh, programs and whether the GDP surplus or the primary surplus in Greece is four percent or two percent I think what they've set in motion by inappropriately bailing out the banks and creating all of this sovereign obligation is uh, radical political uh, upheaval and discontinuities in Europe. Uh, it's very possible uh, that in France, uh, at the next election, um, you're going to get uh, the nationalist uh, uh, party in power, which is anti-EU. Uh, in Spain, uh, the, the Podemos party came out of nowhere and now is running like 30% in the polls, way ahead of the uh, incumbent uh, government party. Uh, none of this uh, was visible back in 2, 10, 11, 12 when they were fashioning all of these uh, mechanisms or even when Draghi was promising he would do whatever it takes. So we're in a new phase of this uh, and that is uh, you know, maybe the political blowback of uh, what was a unsustainable and profoundly stupid policy uh, at the beginning, it, it's a uh, you know it's a warning that you have to face down the problem of massive excess debt in the world. It allow some liquidation to occur, allow some losses and write downs to happen, clear the decks because if you don't, uh, you are simply uh, buying a little time and uh, 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 sowing the seeds of much greater uh, and uh, more unpredictable and uncontrollable uh, reactions and blowback uh, down the road. That's the real lesson in Greek, uh, Greece. I mean, this is a ragtag party of Trotskyites and populists and leftists and um, uh, hippies, for that matter. <laughs> And uh, who would have predicted that they would come to power in this uh, dramatic way? Well, you wouldn't have predicted that, um, but it is the consequence of uh, the, the dictation uh, uh, that came out of Brussels uh, when uh, it should have uh, uh, faced the problem uh, from the very beginning in a forthright way. And boy, isn't that just a, a, a metaphor for what's happening all over the world, Japan, U.S., you name it. We've been talking with David Stockman. His website is davidstockmanscontracorner.com. It's an excellent website. I've visited daily. David, you've been very generous with your time today. Thank you so much. Very happy to have the discussion.